Well, first of all, I speak to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Nam or Melbourne. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, land that was never ceded. Now, my presentation, my first slide would have been the title Expropriate or Nationalise. And Renfrey, of course, um, already introduced um, the Berlin situation um, at the end of his talk. So um, I appreciate that. And I guess the title, Expropriate or Nationalise, does con contrast very much with Emily's um, presentation that she um, kicked us off with, um, talking about the push um, that we've seen in Australia for a long time now of um, privatising and selling off um, public um, assets. Now, as um, Renfrey mentioned, the referendum was held just over a year ago on the 26th of September, and um, more than one million people voted in favour of expropriating these large housing property developments. Um, to put this into context, in Berlin, there are 3.7 million people. And of these 3.7 million people, 1.8 million participated in the vote. So of 1.8 million people voting, 1 million voted in favour of expropriating large real estate um, companies. So the demands of the referendum were, there were four parts to it. The first one was very clearly articulating that this expropriation demand refers to housing um, companies, corporations with 3,000 apartments or more. And there is a, um, a constitutional right to expropriation in Germany. And there is a constitutional right to socialization of um, property. And, and I might refer back to that a bit later on again. The second part was that all affected companies would be compensated However, that they would be compensated below market value. That was also stipulated as part of that vote. The third part was that a statutory authority would be established to manage the property and that in the constitution of this statutory authority, it would stipulate that the properties cannot be privatized again in the future. And the fourth part was that um, the common property housing stock will be democratically administered and it specified who would be part of that administration and that would be civil society, rent, uh, society renters, employees and also the um, Berlin government. Now, um, I think Renfrey already sort of um, mentioned the figure of this roughly 1.5 million properties housing properties and flats and, and houses in Berlin. And for, it, for this referendum, around 240,000 properties were affected. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying um, these housing corporations with 3,000 and plus um, properties. And Renfrey already mentioned the largest one of these, um, a, a corporation called Deutsche Wohnen. Um, and they have just over 100,000 properties that they own. And then there was, there was sort of four key large, the main um, corporations, but others as well, and all in up um, affecting 240,000 properties. My next slide would have given you an idea of the, uh, the referendum timeline, which was um, very much publicized. And I really only wanted to show you that to illustrate that this campaign was never meant to be a short campaign. It started in April 2018 and finished in September 21. That's three and a half years. Now, while 
It's true that COVID probably prolonged that campaign a little bit, but it was never anticipated to be short. People were in for the long haul. That was very clear right from the beginning. And also in terms of context, in the period 2016 to 2021, the Berlin state government was the Social Democratic Party, SPD, the Socialists, Die Linke, and the Greens. So it was a coalition government of those three. And Renfrey already mentioned that the SPD was opposed to this right from the start. It was always the Socialists, Die Linke, that pushed the parliamentary um, support for the movement along. At the time, I might just also mention and remind people that federally, we of course had Angela Merkel's government, and that was a coalition government between the Conservatives and the Social um, Democrats. If we're talking about housing, just to contextualize, again, Renfrey mentioned it, 85% of um, Berlin's residents live in rental properties. Um, what I don't think was mentioned yet is that 48% of people um, since like that period of 2011 when rents just rose astronomically, around 48% of people experience rental stress. And rental stress is measured exactly the same way as in Australia, 30% of your income or more. Now, the, the beginning of the organized housing movement is really 2011, and that's, again, that sort of time frame that um, Renfrey alluded to earlier. And it started in a very alternative left-wing um, suburb of, of Berlin. For those of you who know Berlin, um, that suburb is Kreuzberg, and that's in the western, the old western part of Berlin, with a very high population of Turkish migrants. Now, it's, the housing situation is a little bit more complicated. Um, Andrew mentioned the figure of 4% public housing in Australia. If we're looking at in Berlin, we, uh, we can say there's 16% of public housing, but 31% of what we consider social housing. And that includes what Renfrey was talking about in terms of co cooperatives, but it also is um, because of the particular history of Berlin and Cold War, there's also a large proportion of um, subsidized social housing. Um, and Kreuzberg is relevant in this context and why the campaign started there really in terms of the organized housing movement. And that's because uh, the vast majority of these properties were subsidized. And that sub those subsidies came to an end um, in the 2000s, um, reunion, uh, remember reunion of the Germanys was in, in 89, 1989. So all of these things were sort of coming to an end and people were just being totally um, yeah, were evicted, displaced from their, their areas. That's why it started in that um, particular. Now, people, the movement there was very active. Um, the public space had a, a, a like a, a hut, a wooden hut er erected around the Saturday, Friday markets. Um, and people were just engaging with the public constantly. There was, there was regular uh, demonstrations, um, conferences, networking happening. On a more statewide level, the housing movement really kicked off in 2018. And um, it was very much... Um, including as many networks and, and players um, as possible, was always highly multilingual. And also Berlin, of course, is known for its club scene. Um, and the club scene was integrated into this campaign, um, which you know um, caused very colorful um, demonstrations at times. Again, I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, Renfrey mentioned that there was the rent cap that was introduced. This is, of course, the government, the state government being social democratic, socialists and Greens. And then it was um, struck down by the Constitutional Court. Now, the Constitutional Court, that might just be worthwhile mentioning, did not strike it out because it was... Um, it made a judgment on the 
the usefulness, the impact, or the rationale. The reason why the rent cap was struck out was because the Constitutional Court simply said it's a federal matter. The state cannot rule. That's it. It was a purely technical argument, which in some ways means that there's potentially ways around it then in the future. So, um, especially because it had um, such huge support. I lived in Berlin at the time. I, I benefited. My rent went down and then it had to be repaid after the Constitutional Court struck it out. And that was the case for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, okay, so when it comes to the um, referendum campaign and the approach that was taken, um, there's sort of a few things that are worthwhile mentioning. And the first was I already indicated that um, the, the campaign was always intended to be a long campaign. So there was a very a strong emphasis on very solid um, networking, very solid assessment of what um, previous campaigns, what they were lacking, what the shortcomings was, learning from mistakes in the past, um, very much echoing some of the things Andrew and Emily were talking about earlier. There was a very strong emphasis on including tenants that were affected, directly affected, with an analysis that prior housing campaigns were often driven by inner city activists without including the actual um, tenants affected by by. Um, or most horrifically affected. So there was a working group um, set up with the explicit goal of networking. So they went into the outer um, city um, suburbs and really did the, um, there was door knocking. Door knocking occurred like in a, in a very organized manner, um, trying to involve people and trying to um, get networks um, happening locally. Um, there was a very meticulous analysis of um, what solutions are feasible. So the campaign was set out to win. That was always the anticipation. Like as activists, we know we often engage in petition writing campaigns or some campaigns where we know we're not going to win. This campaign was developed in a way that to win. And that was... Um, one of the driving forces of this um, campaign. The slogan was reflecting this as well. The slogan, slogan was so that Berlin remains our home. And it really, it, maybe from a left perspective, we'd say, well, that's a bit vague and it's not very clear in terms of demands. But the, the aim behind the slogan was to ensure that people can come on board, regardless of their political background, their political affiliations, um, because so many people were affected or are affected um, with the housing crisis in, in Berlin. Um, numerous messaging um, channels, um, everything that we already know as well in our campaigning, but the newspapers for older generations, multilingual posters to include the culturally and lingu linguistically diverse communities, social media for younger generations. There was a, a real... Um, um, I guess color coding um, it was used to identify, clearly identify the campaign, and that was purple and yellow vests, um, and they were directly associated with, with the campaign. And one of the big things I wanted to point out as well was the approach of decentralization. And I wrote down a quote of one of the organizers who said, you have to get rid of the temptation to control everything that's happening. And it was really, it was about providing a toolkit with the logo, the typefaces, the material, and basically said to, to communities, you go and organize, you do it. You do it the way you do it, the way you can best organize um, this campaign and support this campaign. So, um, so I've already highlighted some of the strengths of this, um, this campaign, really trying to be as broad as possible, um, not only focusing on the most marginalized and most um, 
severely affected, but trying to get everyone who was affected or was affected by the, the um, crisis involved. Um, and also having this, this message, expropriation will benefit all, not just expropriation will benefit some. Um, there was a lot of emphasis put into professionalism, like there, were, there was commissioning of legal opinions from constitutional lawyers, there was in-depth research of um, opposing arguments and just providing all that material for people to run with. And obviously having um, political representation in parliament does mean there is money that can be put into campaigns and into think, tank, think tanks. So in um, Germany, Die Linke has the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and they supported the campaign fully with policy paper studies, resources, skills, etc. And the professional messaging was very much um, trying not to um, avoid um, secondary issues, really trying to stay on target, on target and really push ahead with, um, with the demands. And the other thing that was quite interesting of the um, referendum campaign, there was no charismatic figureheads. Um, and that was seen as a strength in order not to um, allow um, basically opportunities um, for, for people to sort of focus on individuals. So this happened a year and a bit ago. On the day, there was also federal and Berlin state elections. Um, the left, uh, the Linke, the left party, the socialists lost um, federally quite severely but lost some votes in Berlin as well. That means the, the impact, the influence is uh, less lessened um, on, on a state level. An expert commission has been established and some of the campaign members are part of the expert um, commission, but it's really only Die Linke that is um, con consistently supporting um, the implementation of the referendum. The Greens are a bit low key on the question. Um, so what's happened since in May this year, there was a, um, there was a, um, a conference that was held, an expropriation conference, and this weekend is actually a national conference that is happening in Berlin, and basically um, the campaign is clear that in order to push this, the expropriation question or socialized question ahead, um, that the networks have to be strengthened even more. So the next expropriation campaign has been started and it's been kind of kicked off um, this weekend. Sib, Sib, there's some kind of uh, wind, something happening. So watch your mic and... Um, Keep on, keep on, but watch your mic. So basically this campaign that's happening this weekend is um, titled Socialization um, Strategies for a Democratic Economy. And then the new um, demand is to expropriate energy um, providers. And that's obviously in the context of the Ukraine war, in the context of winter approaching in Europe, and the gas shortages, et cetera. Um, definitely very, very strong link with the climate change movement as well, in order not to rely um, on gas. So I'll just finish on like some, obviously we're talking about a very particular historical context in a different country. Not all is applicable, like we don't have, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I assume we don't necessarily have um, some of the legal provisions in our constitution um, that allow for um, expropriation and socialization, though I may be corrected. But I think one of the key things um, that can be taken away in terms of lessons is really the need to broaden the campaigns beyond activist levels. And I think what Andrew mentioned earlier uh, with the forum coming up and involving academics is, is one very important part um, of that. But obviously unions and um, political parties as well. And, and the way uh, the Greens are going at the moment, I think there's certainly elements of the Greens that can be um, won over to those kind of demands as well. 
I think the lesson of decentralized um, campaign approach is something and enabling self-organization. And again, I think it speaks to some of the stuff that um, Andrew was talking about with horizontal structures as well. Um, and then the focusing of um, on outer suburbs and getting away from um, the more traditional campaign areas and definitely the inclusiveness and the involvement of um, especially tenants when we're talking about um, housing um, movement. Um, yeah, and I might leave it at that.